listening to Shoot It Now, your weekly podcast about indie filmmaking and big budget films with award-winning filmmaker Craig Newland. And welcome to another Shoot It Now podcast. My guest today is a writer who has written a debut novel. The novel already has won awards. The movie rights have been sold to Sony. And it's a great opportunity for you to find out the process of just how daunting this undertaking was for our guest to write a first-time novel, which is now a bestseller. And it's my pleasure to welcome into the program Abigail Dean. Welcome to Shoot It Now. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. And how is lockdown in the UK going for you at the moment? Uh, it's It's been quite a long road at, at this stage. So we are now into, I think, into month three of of a pretty um, pretty strict lockdown, which, which which is a long path. But, you know, that, that that's giving everyone, I think, some some hope heading into spring and summer. So hanging on in here. <laughs> I wonder how many writers have actually come through as a result of the, the virus around the world. It's, it's really interesting to think, isn't it? That I guess if this was the time, um, I, I think that there seems to be a perception that if this was, if, if you were going to write, um, if you were to write something, this was sort of the perfect time to, 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 to do that project. I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. I think it's been a really strange, challenging, tough time in, in many ways. So, so part of me thinks that if, if, if you're feeling kind of guilty for not having, not having done your kind of lifelong, you know, project in this period, I kind of don't blame people. I think it's been really, um, it's been quite draining and, and hard to concentrate, if anything, I would say. So slightly the opposite, I think, is my view. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Girl A, your debut novel, it's about family and the dynamics within. I understand that you come from a smaller family dynamic, and I think that this was a perhaps a driver for you to look at a bigger family dynamic through the lens of your imagination. And we'll get to that side of it very shortly. But I have to ask you, particularly at this moment of time where we are at, what do you make of Meghan Markle's tell-all interview of her in-laws and what's going on in that family dynamic? Yeah, I mean it's a that that's a pretty challenging family, I think, to to, to be a part of. Um, it is a difficult one because, to be honest, I, I mean I, I have a huge amount of sympathy for everything that Meghan Markle has been through at the hands of of the British press, and you know I, I think it will be very very difficult trying to join that family dynamic. And I think also you know everybody has rifts within their family and. Just the idea that that rift um, becomes so public and that it's kind of picked over and analysed is just throws everything into an entirely different dimension of kind of stress and, and difficulty. So, so yeah, it, it's, a, it's a tough situation and um, I have a lot of sympathy with them. I really do. And it seems that a lot of people are comparing the Oprah interview to Lady Diana's, which I think is a little bit unfair because they're completely different. But without doubt, it's history repeating itself. I think that there's a consistency in terms of um, how difficult it is to live within this intense public scrutiny. Um, but but I think that for Meghan Markle, that has been hugely worsened by um but by, by her race and I, and I think that that her kind of makes this particularly sort of appalling um in a way um I, I I sort of just really wish her and Harry the best I think and that they can they can sort of start living a happier life because I think it's really really painful you know to hear just the extent of of suffering that they have been through and I, I think that there's a bravery in speaking about that from a privileged position because I think it makes lots of people who are going through mental illness and who are going through, I think, discrimination feel a lot less alone. But yeah, I, I think there's a consistency just in, in the case of the press scrutiny and and it making it very, very difficult to live a sort of semblance of, um, of a normal life, I think. I spoke to Pip Torrens, who plays Tommy Lassels in the Netflix series The Crown, and he he certainly gave us a bit of a, a breakdown on the protocols and the procedures 
that take place in the firm, which everybody seems to be calling it these days. Of course, it's a fascinating situation with The Crown being so popular with viewers because it does offer an insight into what life is like on the inside. And the one thing that I did take away from what Harry was saying in the interview about the way that both of them have been treated by the palace I did have a a sense of understanding it better because of the way that Peter Morgan has written The Crown and presented Life Within. Now, without The Crown, I probably wouldn't have as much of that backdrop and that appreciation as what I do right now. Have you found a similar type of thing? I know that people, a lot of friends have absolutely loved, um, loved The Crown, though, and I know that it is a very kind of relatively fictionalized version from everything that I have heard. So I haven't watched much of The Crown. Um, <laughs> and I think, um, I don't know, maybe some of it is because I feel like we're quite surrounded by the royal family um, in <laughs> in the UK, and I guess in the Commonwealth, um, you know, as well. So I, I don't know, I, I don't maybe have the same sort of I- intrigue, I guess, um, with the royal family, to be honest. Um, I think that I'm, I might have almost controversial view by not here by not having kind of that much fascination with them. Um, uh-huh. I, I can see the sort of interest of um, of there being kind of a, a, a family, you know, and, and sort of living in the public eye. And I, I guess, obviously, I am someone who's interested in kind of big families and the dynamics between them. But but in this case, yeah, I, um, I think that we hear a lot about them. And I think that obviously, they, they have their issues and sometimes I I guess I sort of wonder whether they, be, they should be afforded a bit more privacy in, in some ways and, and that's kind of the extent of my that's almost the extent of my um my, my views about it maybe I should maybe I should give it another go <laughs> so back to that original question about you coming from a smaller family dynamic and I think that this was uh, maybe a bit of a driver for you to look at a bigger family dynamic was that the case yeah, I, I think it was. It, it's been something since childhood that I have always been quite interested in um, because because I viewed it as an outsider. And, um, and I think because I've sort of lacked the understanding in some ways of the dynamics within bigger families. Um, I remember going to friends' houses and, um, you know, seeing them interact with their siblings, particularly as a child. And I just kind of didn't get that you could, um, you know, how you could sort of really detest somebody and be really deeply annoyed by them um, in, in the same moment that you would stick up for them against anybody outside the family. You know, it's that thing, I think, that you can criticise um, your siblings as much as you like, you know, quite dramatically. But if anybody says anything against them, that's not OK. Um, and I found, I always find that kind of um, mix of being really protective while being kind of often very frustrated, just really, really interesting. And, and you know, I think I had some envy as well for, for, for that relationship, which I lacked. And I think that that's the kind of thing that motivates you to often think about characters um, and, and to think about creating kind of a bigger family w- within my writing anyway, to, to sort of try to understand how that dynamic does work. And um, in a way, I guess, to kind of write the family that I myself don't necessarily have, um, which I think is, is to a great extent what what I did in Girl A, um, albeit I'm not sure I could deal with the different um, the different siblings and the different dynamics they have um, that, that Lex has to deal with. Now, I've heard that you'd almost given up on a writing career and was working in a law office and decided to take a break and go, woof, straight into writing your novel. And I think that there are so many of our indie filmmakers listening right now who will be able to identify that exact moment in a job where the creative valve is switched off a sense of tedious day in day out existence but nothing satisfied in the way of paid work and there lies the problem of course because we need paid work to survive so it is a bit of a catch-22 situation however you had enough money to cover yourself did this feel like a a bit of a hail mary moment for you when you took this three months off to get busy it did a bit uh it, it 
it, it, I don't quite know why it felt like now or never to me, um, but, but, but it certainly did at the time. I, I think it was a sort of combination of um, having gone through a really rough few months at work, um, you know, to, to the extent that I was sort of becoming deeply unhappy and I, and I really did absolutely nothing but work for, for quite a few months. I think it was that um, sort of coupled with my 30th birthday was coming up. I had spent a lot of my 20s kind of behind a desk, often doing things that were exciting and doing things that I did enjoy, but ultimately things that were not necessarily kind of what, I, what I'd always wanted to do. I, I think for me, it was, it was a bit of a kind of, um, this is, okay, this is the moment, you're, you're really not very happy right now. I was very fortunate enough to have saved enough money to, to, to kind of take three months off work. And um, yeah, it, 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 things just sort of fell together, I think, because um, I, I was also kind of, um, I, I don't want to sort of overstate the risk that I was taking. So, so I was also lucky around that time that though there was a job that I applied for at Google that I knew would be a more, um, a more sort of writing friendly job um that you know that it would it would not require the same time demands as working in a law firm had so i was i also could kind of line that up for the end of the three month period um which you know standard risk averse lawyer (laughs) for, for me kind of i needed that safety i think blanket to to have waiting so so it kind of wasn't the case that I was sort of quitting with nothing with nothing ahead of me and that I think enabled me to really enjoy the three months in a way that I would not have been able to if I had been kind of wondering about uh, about what came next Um, and that that's kind of my own my own kind of personality I think I'm sure some people are far far braver um, and, and far more risk tolerant well, you're talking to uh, a lot of filmmakers listening to this right now, and each and every one of the filmmakers, I can tell you, they've gone through this moment that you're describing. Because without going through it, without getting to that funnel end of the bottle where you've either got to push through or all the work, all the thinking, all the thoughts, all the creative uh, flow that has been going on for so many years just gets pushed to the back. So if we don't step forward, we're not going to be able to get into that creative space. Yeah, I, I think that was a real realisation for me. Um, that, oh, and, and I think that's why the sort of um, 30th birthday kind of played a bit of a role. Because I, I very clearly sort of looked ahead and, and thought, well, you know, if, if you don't actually make a change and try to do this and actually try to write you will be here at your 40th birthday um, and you will not have written anything (laughs) and you, you know, you, and then you'll still be here at your 50th birthday. Um, Because that is kind of the nature, I think of a lot of jobs, um, especially jobs that are comfortable um, as, as mine kind of was in many ways that it's, it's much easier to, to, to stay. Um, And I'm very, very grateful as well, in, for my husband in giving me this kind of very, very brutal piece of advice um, that I think made that very clear to me, uh, which was, I, I would often say uh, throughout kind of my late 20s, especially, oh, you know, well, my dream job would be to be a writer, but, you know, that, you know that's, that's a bit ridiculous. Or, you know, well, ideally, you know, in the perfect world, I'd be a writer. Um, and he'd obviously kind of heard me say this on a number of occasions. Um, and he eventually said it, it very kindly, you know, this is going to sound awful, but it was it was said in um, with kind of genuine kindness. Well, you're, you're not going to be a writer if you don't write anything. Um, sure. And it, it, it's very true. Um, and I think that was actually a bit of a wake up call that I, that I think I'd almost in, in some ways quite liked this. Um, the, the idea of something, you know, oh, well, it's just completely unattainable. Um, and I think that was quite a brutal reminder that actually it will remain entirely unattainable if you don't um, actually write anything. And it's something that you had been thinking about for a long time. Is it true that from the age of 16, you were submitting some of your writings to writing houses? 
It is, yeah. Um, so when I was sort of 16, 17, um, I guess all, all through being a teenager, I wrote a huge amount. I remember being kind of 11 or 12 and getting up to write before school on my parents' kind of like clunky old desktop, <laughs> I mean, like the earliest version of Microsoft Word. Um, and so it had been something that I did a huge amount then. Um, and I remember at 16, 17 submitting um, a, an absolutely dreadful novel to agents um, and obviously kind of had no, had no luck. But, but I think in a way, the, the sad thing was that pretty shortly after that, when I went to university, uh, I, um, that stopped and, um, and I didn't really write in my 20s very much at all. Um, so, so I guess it almost gives the impression, I guess, you know, sort of, of, of thinking I was submitting to agents when I was 16 and 17, that, that then there was a kind of consistency of effort. Um, and I don't think there was because I, um, I don't think I had a huge amount of sort of self-confidence in my writing. Um, I was kind of working pretty hard in that period. And I also had very precious um, ideas, I think, in my 20s about writing, particularly around the sort of uh, environment that I had to be writing in. Um, so, so there were specific things that I decided I needed, like I needed a good few hours of time and I needed, um, you know, I, I kind of needed silence and um, I needed to be at this particular desk or whatever. And I think all of that just completely got in the way of ever doing the writing itself. So I was maybe writing a few short stories and you know, a few kind of sketches, character sketches, in that that those years but I was maybe writing kind of once every few months once a month um which yeah is is probably not enough to to actually make make genuine progress um so so it was kind of a, a bit of a up and down really um, a lot of writing when I was younger but but I let it get away from me um for, for a very long stretch of time for, for a decade or so so let's come back to 30 years old. It's approaching. You've decided to take the three months off. How did you work through the process? You've got this three months. What process do you work through when you are writing? This will be of uh, particular interest to, to our writers, to our indie filmmakers. Yes. It, so in that three months, um, I was pretty strict with my writing process. Um, so I wrote in a library uh, near to my house, um, near to my flat, kind of a um, 25 minute walk away. Uh, so I would kind of walk there um, sort of every morning, make sure I was there by sort of uh, 10 or 11. I'm, I'm not a great, uh, I'm not a great early morning worker the way I was, the way I was as a child. I've, unfortunately, I've lost that motivation. Um, so, so yeah, I, I would, and I kind of would walk there listening to um, very specific music, um, which I, I kind of usually have a sort of playlist of, of songs that remind me of the characters and the, 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 that sort of I associate with whatever I'm working on. And um, it was a heatwave summer, uh, so I would sit on the top floor of um, of this library and would try to work for say um, two two or three hours in the morning. Kind of take take an hour or so for lunch, um, sit in the sunshine. So it all sounds very idyllic. Then would tend to work kind of relatively. Um, I say late into the evening. I sort of mean like seven or eight o'clock which is not, I know by a lot of writer's standards, that's not late at all. Um, and then walked, walked back. Uh, so, so I treated it a, um, kind of like a, a, just like a sort of job, I guess, in that period. Um, but I think for me, the great benefit was that the hours were significantly better <laughs> than they had been at the law firm that I was working at. And I was also doing something that I had kind of wanted to do for, for, for a very long time. But but I want to make clear that that process was not how I wrote the the second half of Girl A, um, and it's it's also not how I've kind of written my my second novel, because I I think you know I, I look back and that that period of time was an absolute privilege. It, it was idyllic, and I think that the fact is that f for me and, and for most people um, writing, you know, you don't have the luxury of 
three three months, um, th- three kind of beautiful summer months when you can sit in a library. So that I guess is my ideal writing process. Um, but but the, the kind of real writing process that, that has been in place for the last um, year and a half now um, has been very, very different. And it looks much more like it's a Saturday and Sunday afternoon or it's late into the evening or it's on a bus, you know, on, on the notes section of my phone. And before you got to the library, how much work in terms of structure with the treatments, in terms of a foundation of story, had you already developed? I had a kind of plan, but but it was a relatively vague plan. Um, so I certainly hadn't kind of planned every scene the, the way that I, I know some writers um, do. I, I had kind of, um, I had the characters, um, I had some of the characters anyway, um, the, 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 the Gracie family in Girl A, there are seven uh, siblings and I had a very, very clear idea of three of them. And I knew how the book would be structured. So I knew that each chapter, um, each of the seven chapters would focus on a different sibling. But, and I knew how the book would end. And that's about it. So that there was, I, I sort of started writing with a lot left to the sort of time to come, I guess. And um, I sort of trusting, I think I do trust quite a lot that as you begin writing, you find out more about the characters and the plot changes for me as I as I go. I don't think I would ever say quite that the characters take on a life of their own. Um, I think that's you know, possibly a bit too pretty pretentious for me to say, but <laughs> I, I think that as you write, you work out problems and the, the characters do develop. And I think as they develop their arcs and the, the sort of course that they take throughout the, the story does change. So a bit of both, I think. I like having an end. I like having an end point, and I like having clarity as to where everybody will end up, um, but 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 not quite how they'll get there. It's quite refreshing to hear you say that because you've almost given yourself this freedom of a little bit loose for the ideas to come through as you are writing, uh, particularly about the siblings and those character, the development. It all sort of happens as you work through a story, but also character. It's very important for you to know early on the end of the story and how that plays out. In other words, uh, that helps enormously for you getting to the place that you've got to get to, but also throughout writing the novel, it's so helpful to know where things end up. I definitely find that it, it, it's sort of, I guess, the one um, anchor that, that you have. Uh, and I, I think that maybe if I was somebody who kind of plotted much more meticulously, so, you know, I had the first half immaculately plotted out, it, it would feel more comfortable not to know how things ended. But but yeah, I, I think because I do leave quite a lot to, to the sort of writing, I, I like having some idea um, of where of where things are going because I think otherwise I'm worried I would feel a bit like I was floundering. Um, and I, I definitely feel like that anyway at times. Um, you know, there are obviously certain plot points, you know, that, that you do get stuck on uh, and that do take kind of maybe a month of, thinking and you know the, the th- thinking when you're in the shower or you know when you're on your commute um the, the sort of writing time that is not necessarily writing time but is still goes towards what what ends up on the page I, I definitely have that experience and have had it in writing um my second novel and have kind of only relatively recently just sort of managed to untie it all to to, to an extent that I'm, I'm pretty happy now but yeah, I think having that one piece of certainty is for me um, as to how things will end is, um, or at least, you know, how, how you think things are going to end roughly is, is really important. And I get the sense that making your characters as human as possible may have made you go down almost this whole character study for your characters. Is that, is that how you aim for that to to land or is it just the process of the writing that you're able to get to that place? Characters to me sort of are, I don't want to say sort of the most important part of, uh, of writing, but, but I feel like they're completely sort of crucial. There's very few things that I have watched or read 
that I've loved, that I've not loved to some extent because of the characters. So to me, that is a really key part of, of writing, um, that I want every character to be to be sort of understandable to, to some extent. Um, you know, that, that I think even the most minor characters who are introduced should feel genuine and, and real. Because I kind of think that that does a lot of writing for you. you know, if, if you have this sort of cast of, um, of interesting, sympathetic, understandable um, human beings, then that really almost protects the story in a certain way in a certain way. Um, so I, I don't know if I kind of did, um, necessarily did character studies, um, but but I, I just spent a lot of time kind of mulling them over and, um, and wondering how they would react to the events of the book and, you know, what had happened between the, their childhoods in the case of the Gracie siblings. We all can be very obsessive about our characters, though, and I, I get the sense that perhaps you, you are a little bit obsessive about your characters. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. Um, you know, I, I actually I found it, um, I, at first I would find it really, really difficult when I was talking about the characters to, um, to sort of talk about them as real people because I, you know, I almost felt slightly embarrassed doing that. But it was that that is sort of how I think about them, you know, as I'm as I'm writing. So, so I think it was just quite hard to almost convert that view that had been in my head for a very long time to, to actually talking publicly about Girl A and, and, and about the characters in, in the book. But but I am quite obsessive about them. I, I say obsessive and I, I kind of mean just that. I think I spent a long time kind of dwelling on them. Kind of, I knew some writers will, um, you know, will have a list of questions that they could answer about each character. You know, like what, what's their favorite food and where would they go on their dream holiday? You know, there's like a sort of list of um, of things that you should sort of know about your characters. I've never really done that, but I I do sort of think a lot about how how they speak and and their kind of dialogue um, and kind of you know spend that there's there's dead times that I mentioned um earlier around you know, the, the commute and so lying in the bath um thinking about maybe how they will how they do talk um about how they do interact with with each other maybe in quite a cinematic way as well um because I'm a big tv and film addict and, and I often do sort of that that's I think how I often think of interactions between characters in, in sort of quite a visual way so yeah, I think it's just a lot of dwelling and, and obsessing, basically, over, over, the, over the time, over the months and years. Abigail, I think this is probably the perfect time for you to just tell us a little bit about what Girl A, your novel, is about. Uh, sure. Uh, so Girl A, um, the girl A of the title is Lex, Lex Gracie, and she manages to escape from her parents' house as a child um that the, the house that becomes known as the house of horrors in the press and when she does she frees her six brothers and sisters and exposes her parents crimes um, which they've been committing against their children as part of a um, kind of religious cult within this house and girl a opens 15 years after that escape and by that point lex lives in new york um, she's a successful attorney. She, she does essentially everything she can uh, to avoid thinking about her family and thinking about her past. That is until her mother dies in prison. And when she does, she leaves Lex and her brothers and sisters, the house of horrors, you know, the family home in her will. And that forces Lex to uh, return to the UK um, to, to, to reconnect with her siblings, um, to, you know, resurrecting those old battles and all the alliances that they, they've shared in childhood uh, to decide the fate of, um, of the family home. And as mentioned at the top of the show, it's a bestseller girl A. Sony has picked it up, so it's going to be turned into a film. I understand that the Chernobyl director read your novel and you are somebody, as chance would have it, was gripped by the Chernobyl series and now you suddenly discover 
the same director has read your book, which led to a phone call. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that that was um, that was kind of incredible. Uh, you know, I, I guess it, it, exactly as surreal and unbelievable as, as it sounds. Uh, so, so I I, I'm, I I do absolutely love TV, and I love limited series in particular. Recently, I've kind of you know I've, I loved Chernobyl, and I loved Patrick Melrose um, and Sharp Objects. Uh, so, so I, I'm I'm kind of really huge huge TV fan. But often when I should be writing, I'm actually watching <laughs> actually watching TV. Um, so so I, I think that, yeah, hearing that Johan Renk had loved Gurley was just, just, just kind of b- bizarre and wonderful. I, I thought that Chernobyl had such a mix of bleakness and beauty to it. Um, it's obviously it's set in a devastating landscape, but there are these amazing human relationships that are taking part w- within that landscape. Um, incredibly kind of tender um, moments between the characters, a- and it's also you know the, the devastate- devastation is um, is shot so beautifully uh, as well. I-, I just thought it was wonderful, uh, and so I think that you know. Having somebody who has created something like Chernobyl, e- even read Gurle and like it, it, is kind of a dream come true um, in itself. You just never know who's reading the book. This is this is like a film. <laughs> no. You never know, never know who's going to watch your film. You never know who's reading your book. So, okay, so Sony have decided to pick up the rights. What about turning the novel into a screenplay? Are you up for the challenge of doing that? Um, so I am not doing that, no. Um, and to, to be honest, it's I think the, the, the main reason is um, I I don't really know how to write for, for TV. At least I don't right now. Um, and I think the combination of um, of having a team who kind of do know do know that and working on my second novel just meant that I think now is probably not the time for that challenge. Um, Mm -hmm. um, Maybe in the future, but I feel like right now I'm sort of happy to leave that to, to to people who do have the experience and for who that is kind of how they, how they write while I kind of finish up book two. And apart from Chernobyl, what are some of your favorite movies? Oh, it's, um, it's a great question. Um, So I'd say right up there are um, uh, Lost in Translation uh, is one of my favorite one of my favorite films. Um, I, I I love the the setting and I, I love the soundtrack. Um, I, I absolutely adore Pan's Labyrinth. Um, I've watched it kind of multiple times and still weep every single every single time uh, without without exception. I also really love um, a kind of a nineties crime thriller. Um, so I love, um, I love seven. Um, yeah. it was one of the first kind of films that I really, really remember watching and just being kind of totally, um, bowled over by and you know, disturbed by and, and, and gripped. And I spent last Sunday afternoon, I, had, I wasn't feeling particularly well. Um, and I spent it uh, revisiting Point Break, <laughs> which oh. I, it was a very, it was a fantastic few hours <laughs> of, um, uh, of sort of entertainment. So, so yeah, a big, a big variety. Well, it's a massive variety. I wasn't expecting that, Abigail. I was expecting a lot more dark psychological thriller types. Yeah, it's um I think it's um it's a, it's a real mix for me. Um there are definitely um, some sort of dark psychological thrillers that I've um, that I've enjoyed. Um but no, I I'm I'm sort of have a really mixed taste when it comes to when it comes to movies. Um I have very um, in this household we have a strict uh, definition of a Sunday afternoon film. Um because because often I, I do sometimes want to watch something quite relatively dark. Um, and you know, like seven fight clubs and something like along those lines. Um, but but Sunday afternoons are reserved for classic, um, classic kind of blockbusters along Point Break, The Fugitive, um, Indiana Jones. <laughs> but, but, but those are the only films that are allowed on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Coming back to dark, there is something about dark psychological characters that is 
very tasty to start penning and hitting the the keyboard, bringing that character to life. It, it's certainly something that I relish in terms of the dark type of psychological story. And I get the sense that you obviously find the same type of dark writing where it captures you. I do, I think. Um, I, I, um, I think I'm always interested in how, how dark effect, um, events do affect particular characters, how kind of characters look, I guess, when they are in extreme circumstances it is something that I do think is, is, is really interesting. Um, I think it requires you to sort of ask difficult questions of yourself. How would you have reacted in, in the, within this house or, you know, if you were faced with this crime? Um, th- those are always going to be interesting questions. So I definitely do find, do find that. And I, I think it's it's certainly the case that some of the darker characters um, of things that I've consumed are, are, are the ones that stay with me. Uh, so, you know, I think about um, Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl. Um, I think about Amy Dunn within that novel. I, I probably think about her like once a week. <laughs> you know, I think that, yeah. that there are particular kind of dark creations that, that really do stick with you. I I probably think about Shakespeare's Iago once a week. (laughs) And so I I often think it is um, that they are the most memorable characters and and I think made more so often when you have a quite an ordinary character who is put in an incredibly dark situation and the the question of what does that do to them is, is as fascinating as having these kind of very dark characters in a way. So I think that that kind of, in, in both cases, I think that there are, there's lots for literature and film to, to explore. Well, Abigail Dean, it's been a great conversation hearing about some of your processes for writing Girl A and the way that you are navigating the writing world and also the film world. And I'm looking forward to seeing it up on the big screen, the adaption for Girl A. And thank you so much for coming on and talking to us on Shoot It Now. No worries, that was great. Thank you for having me. It's it's been a great discussion. Thanks so much. You've been listening to Shoot It Now with Craig Newland, your weekly podcast about all things behind the camera and in front of it. Until next time, have a great week.